very much. It's been a, a long day. Um, hopefully we're going to go out on a high note, uh, because it's my pleasure to introduce to you now uh, Peter Madden. Uh, Peter is uh, the relatively recently appointed chief executive of the Future Cities Catapult, which is a major new initiative uh, supported by the UK Technology Strategy Board, or launched by the UK Technology Strategy Board, to stimulate innovation in city infrastructure and systems, smart cities, future cities, etc. Um, Peter's come hot foot, I think, from a, a strategy meeting at the Future Cities Catapult, so we're very grateful indeed that he's decided to spend the early evening with us. Peter has a, a long history of public service uh, and work in the uh, charitable sectors uh, with DEFRA and with the Environment Agency and with Forum for the Future, amongst other things, I'm sure. Um, and I think what we hope, I think, we're, we're going to hear from Peter is, a, is a, a vision of where the future cities catapult sees itself going and how it wishes to engage with some of the challenges that we've been discussing here this afternoon. So, so with that, I'll hand the floor to Peter. Thanks very much. I think I'll just use this microphone. That's, that's a good yeah, so good evening, everybody. I thought you were about to say it's been a long day and it's going to get longer. Um, I'll try and, and keep this relatively brief, and partly because I've, I've been in post for three months and we, we're, we're an emergent centre and, and things are moving very quickly and we're learning as we go along. So what I want to do is just share where we are at the moment with you and, and as much as anything get your views and perhaps in the drinks afterwards or um, uh, in, in, in kind of follow up to kind of get, get your input and views because exactly what you've been talking about today is at the heart of what we're trying to do in the Catapult Centre and we had our board meeting um, today so unfortunately none of our senior staff could have joined you otherwise, um, otherwise we would have been here. And just before I start there's that interesting question about privacy. I was in the States last year and last week and I think privacy is an even bigger issue there for various kind of constitutional historical reasons. But there was some talk about functional encryption. So if anyone here knows about functional encryption, that, and this is the idea that you can encrypt, but in such a way that you can, you can draw certain um, conclusions fr from data so that you pr pr protect privacy but allow some of the, the, the lessons and the big data stuff to come out of it. So if, any, if anyone knows about that, can you um, talk to me um, at the end? So um, the, the Future Cities Catapult. Um, what I thought I'd do was just explore three questions with you. Um, the first is, why have we set up a Future Cities catapult in London? Um, secondly, what is it that we're going to do or think we're going to do at the moment? And then thirdly, um, how is that relevant to you um, as a community? So first of all, why an innovation centre? Um, Innovation seen as the lifeblood um, of our economy, society frames challenges and we innovate products, services, business models and increasingly system systemic responses to, to respond to those challenges. And there's this sort of generally perceived wisdom that in the UK we're quite good at bits of innovation. We're quite good at ideas, we're quite good at R&D, we're quite good at invention. And we're also quite good at running businesses. You think about the Unilevers, the Tesco's, the Vodafone. You know, we're good at running business, good at innovation, good at business. But between those two things, something dies. And in innovators indeed call it the valley of death. So there's a gap between conception and commercialization. And there's a kind of perceived wisdom that too much of our IP and ideas go, go overseas and other people commercialize them. So the UK government, in the guise of Peter Mandelson a few years ago, asked the question about how could we get better at this and how do we bridge that gap between conception and commercialization. And they got a guy called Herman Hauser who was part of Acorn Computers and very, very involved in the, in the Cambridge cluster to go and do a study. And he looked at the Fraunhofer centers in Germany. People know the Fraunhofer's are kind of seen as a big part of the German economic success story. Been around for 50 years developing intimate relationships between the, the university sector and, and business and localities. And he produced a report which suggested that we come up with our own version of, of the Fraunhofer centers in, in the UK. Been through a couple of name changes, but to be the catapult centers. This idea that we're going to bridge the, the, the gap between conception and commercialization. Seven catapult centers and now nine, the government um, have announced. And they're in quite diverse areas. Areas where the government felt that we in the UK could be a world leader um, 
econo in, in economic and business terms with a bit more focus and a bit more effort. So things like offshore renewables, stem cell therapies, satellite applications, and, and my own one, um, cities. And I'll just say as a quick aside, quite producerist in, 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 in their conception. So very much um, about industry needs and seeing innovation, I think, from an industry lens. Um, and all of the others chaired and staffed by senior figures from the, the industries in question, except for my catapult. And mine is the only one that's been a little bit disruptive in, in having a chair, Sir David King, um, who's an academic, and myself with a background in innovation, who are, are coming at this slightly differently. So that's the catapult centres. Why cities? I don't think I need to re rehearse that with this audience. We know about the urban um, challenges, and you will have rehearsed them today. Um, so I, I can short-circuit that bit. But to say that we, we've decided in the catapult to focus on one particular set of issues, and that's issues around urban integration and, and joining up, and asking the question about how cities can be better places for people and, and the environment and the economy by taking more joined up approaches to how they function and how they run. So the very, very question that you've been, um, you've been talking about today, and this kind of sense that too often we kind of make things fight against each other in cities and we take siloed um, ap approaches to our problems. So how can we innovate solutions for more integrated and, and, and joined up responses to urban challenges? And we, did a, we commissioned a couple of studies, the Technology Strategy Board, that said the global market for these integrated city systems, around 50 billion pounds today, growing to um, 200 billion by 2030. So quite a sizable market potentially there in helping cities um, function more effectively. So that's the why innovation, uh, why cities. Why London and, and, and indeed, indeed the UK? The Technology Strategy Board looked around and looked at kind of what the resources that we have in this country and a sense that, and, and to, to take just London but, uh, but, but read for this the whole of the UK, we've got some of the best companies in the world um, working on, on, on city issues and the kind of people speaking o o over these couple of days, the consulting engineers, the Arabs, the Atkins, the Bureau, Happels, the infrastructure companies, top architecture um, firms in the world, at law, investment. So in, in, as good, I think, in London as any city in the world, set of businesses dealing with city challenges and able to, to approach cities in, in, in an integrated way. Top universities, and again, it's invidious just to pick London, but you think about um, Imperial, where, where, where we are, UCL Bartlett School, LSE Centre for Cities, and then you multiply that with the strengths and the growing strength across the UK in the, in the, in the university sector in, in, on, the, on these issues. Our civic tradition, more of our city leaders starting to get this issue, culture of innovation um, in, in this country, and London as a global brand. London is a city that, that resonates with people around the world as a place where, where you might expect leading thinking on, on cities to be happening. So a decision that that's a really rich ecosystem um, in London and in the UK on, on, on this set of issues, and a feeling increasingly that you need an ecosystem to innovate, but also for integrated city stuff, you need an ecosystem to deliver. There isn't, a, there isn't a business out there that can go and deliver these integrated and joint-up solutions on its own. And actually, we're going to need partnerships and joint approaches and new ways of thinking, and that perhaps the catapult and the ecosystem in London can be part of making that happen. So that's the genesis. Um, what are we actually going to do um, as, as a centre? So we've got the huge global potential. We've got the strong... UK positioning and, and, and this, this giant market potentially out there. So we then ask the question about, well, why isn't it happening? Why aren't cities taking joined up um, intelligent decisions about their functioning and about their infrastructure? Why aren't the businesses like IBM and Cisco and Siemens that have invested so much in this kind of smart cities area, why aren't they selling? And we surveyed around 50 cities ar around the world, city leaders around the world, and, to and 400, over 400 top business people to say, what are the barriers to, to ha have, have this market coalescing? Because if you think about it, we're spending taxpayers' money on establishing this catapult. So we need to be tackling barriers that if we weren't there, it wouldn't happen anyway, if that makes sense. So um, we, we, we analyzed a series of barriers that we thought by establishing the catapult and acting in certain ways, we could unlock, um, unlock the change and unlock the market. And th there's a list of barriers, but I'll, I'll give you a flavor of them. Um, 
So the first one is about the market being ill-defined and the language being, being conflicted and confusing. And people just don't get the language around integrated urban systems and infrastructure. It's too complicated and um, can't quite grasp um, what it's all about. A sense that cities are not good at taking decisions um, uh, for the long term and, and in a joined up way. And any of us that have worked with cities will, will recognize that. And companies just saying, you know, cities just can't do this joined up thing and, and do, the, do the smart stuff. And on the other hand, you go to the cities and say, why not? And of course, there's politics and institutions and, and silos and so on. But they also say, well, the reality is the only people telling us about this and offering this, the solutions are the IBMs and the Cisco's and the Siemens who say, come and test it on our proprietary um, technology and oh by the way we'd like to sell you some outsourcing and um, lock you into a deal for the next 10 or 15 years and the cities are sort of a bit hesitant and a bit nervous to, to enter into that um, rela relationship. There's a sort of market failure going on, the potential on both sides and not, and not quite, quite meeting. Um, governance and politics we know about lack of business case and business model for um, a, a lot of these investments prove the return and how, how do we prove it and make it happen, legal, procurement, financial obstacles and from a lot of people saying they, there isn't a place where they can come together in a neutral way to test this out and, um, and see whether it works. So we took those barriers and said okay what are we going to invest in in terms of capabilities to make them happen. So the first investment um, is around the Innovation Centre in London and I was a bit conflicted about this one because I kind of came from a background where it sort of said, well, the, the innovation and the knowledge should be, should be distributed and the city should be our playground. And why are we thinking about a centre that we're going to make all of this um, happen in? But uh, partly why I explained the history and the genesis of the catapult centres, there's a strong view that these should be centres um, in the Fraunhofer mould. So they're places and locations where, which will be around for 10, 20, 30 years that knowledge will be built around and maintained in. So there is going to be a centre and it's going to be one of my first jobs is to, is to procure a, sm a very smart central London innovation centre where people can come together from different disciplines, different backgrounds and um, have the space and the opportunity to innovate around challenges. And also where when overseas visitors come, uh, come over I'll be on a sort of dancing monkey tour where you know the mayor of Beijing or, or Shanghai comes across and they'll be taken to, to see my amazing innovation centre to show what our capabilities um, are in London. So we're going to be building this innovation space in London which will be a place for people like you to come play, get involved with different sectors and particularly um, opening up to small and medium um, sized businesses so that they can, they can take advantage. And then within and around that centre there's three capabilities that I'm going to spend my money on um, in the early period. Um, the first of these is futures. And I come from a background of using exploration of the future through scenarios, through trends, through visioning, horizon scanning to change the way that organizations and groups of organizations think about the world and get them to innovate different solutions in, in the present because they've seen the future in different ways. So I'm going to invest a reasonably sizable urban futures team in the catapult and it will have a, it will have a few roles. The first will be a sort of um, engagement role to go out and get people to look jointly at problems and, and to buy in to think differently um, about the world because they've gone into the future and looked at the opportunities. Secondly, we really, really don't want to spend a lot of time innovating and getting smarter at the broken systems of the past because well, why would we do that? So to look to what we need in, in the future and make sure that our innovation challenges and opportunities are targeted at those big opportunities coming out 10, 15, um, 20 um, years hence. And from previous work I've done with the, the likes of Apple and Sony and Levi's and, and Nike, using the innovation process and, and showing people the opportunities in the future to generate innovations and um, the beginning of innovations in products and services and business models that can be then worked on. So my first capability will be a futures capability which we hope will be very useful to you as a community and, and uh, uh, to, to, to businesses but also to help inform cities about what they need to be thinking about and where they need to be investing. The second um, 
capability is what we're calling at the moment our lab, and its name has changed um, a, a couple of times. But this is a, a going to be a large-scale technical facility. It's going to be my biggest investment um, by far. And it's going to be a technical facility that will allow people to come and plug in urban data, play with it, mash it up, draw conclusions from it, visualize, and, and help to kind of show and, 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 and um, crystallize the possibilities and what might happen if we take a more joined up approach to, to urban systems. And my idea is that we'll probably spend, I, I think probably about 10 million um, pounds on, on establishing this. No, no one's got anything quite like this in the world, so it's, it is an experiment in how, in how we're go going to build it. But the idea is that a city, at the moment, cities often aren't doing what we want in this area, aren't being intelligent clients, because they don't even know how to define the question. So the idea is that a city could come to us, and we'll have a team of 30 um, or 40 people, data scientists, anthropologists, socio-economists, facilitators, that will work with those cities and say, this is your challenge, this is your data, let's start to surface the questions and, and the opportunities such that you can then go and talk to the IBMs, the Cisco's, the Siemens and whoever to, um, to, to, to think about um, what, what the possibilities are. So we'll have a role in defining the questions and, and making the market. It will be a place we hope where people will come and do collaborative innovation and play and test things out. And it will be a place where SMEs, people with an idea to change a city, where it, it's very difficult to test those ideas at scale if you're a small business. We'll be able to come, plug it in, and look at how that might unfold at, at city scale, um, and then be able to tell stories to investors and, and, and to potential clients. So that's the idea. Um, it, it's emergent, how, how we're building it, and we're going to build it in a very modular way. So we're not going straight for a model of models, because we think that would take us years and we'd probably get it wrong. We're going to build it from the bottom up, and we're going to have a particular emphasis on two bits of, um, of, of that chain of, of, of data, data mashing, um, analysis, and visualization, and so on. Um, w w one is around facilitation. So a lot of cities and companies have said to us, actually, it's not so much the kind of the data and the algorithms and so on that we need. It's the ability to take a bunch of city leaders in and get them to work together as a group and ask the right questions. So get people who can facilitate the, their easy interaction with this, with, 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 with the data channels and um, with, with, the, uh, with the opportunities. So we will invest heavily in making the experience for people that come in one that flows and is good and, and, and is easy. And the second thing that we will invest in heavily is the back-end visualization and storytelling. And a lot of the SMEs said to us that we're perfectly capable of going away and doing the crunching um, week on week, month on month. What we can't invest in is the expensive kit. They said they, they, they then go with a tiny laptop and try and present the whole story to, to somebody. To be able to come into the lab and be in a theater and have the best visualization kit, 3D imaging and, and so on, that could be able to take a city leader to the corner of a street in his or her city to look around and show how things could be different. That kind of thing will be, they, they think will be incredibly powerful in unlocking the market and unlocking the opportunity. We have a sort of brains trust of leading companies and individuals and academics helping us um, develop this. But as I say, it's emergent and we're learning um, as we go along. And I was with CUSP. Do people know CUSP in New York um, last week? And th they're, they're thinking about something similar. I think they're ahead of us on the data side. They're doing some really interesting stuff on different city data, um, data feeds. I think we're ahead of them on the sort of innovation and, and visualization side, but we'll be, we'll be kind of cross-learning and cross-fertilizing. And then the third thing that um, we're going to be investing time and, and money in it is a program around scaling up and removing barriers. So if you imagine we look at the future, define the innovation questions and what we want to work on, we use the lab and programmers around that to come up with great innovations and ideas, and they come out and they run bang smack into procurement rules, legal obstacles, IP difficulties, lack of financing. Um, and so, so we're going to spend some of our time on budget on thinking about what are those common barriers that particularly SMEs, but innovators of all kind, run into again and again, trying to take integrated city solutions to scale. And then how can we spend some money 
because an, an SME cannot possibly remove a big procurement barrier that runs across many cities, but if we could invest some money and time o over a period of time to remove it once, then 100 businesses can benefit um, on the back of doing that. So we'll have a handful of innovation programs to remove the barriers, enable the market, and help those solutions go to scale. So that's the vision that, that looking, looking into the future, spotting the challenges, getting people engaged, doing the innovation in a very collaborative way with the lab as our main facility, and then helping to scale up and support the solutions that, that come out um, of the back end. What will I get um, judged on at the end of five years? Well, there's three, um, I think, three main areas where um, the, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be looked at. The first is the number of exportable innovations that come out of, um, that come out of the centre. And if we think about those Fraunhofer centres, they've been around for 50, 60 years, and it takes decades to change industrial structures and skill bases and so on. But you can imagine that our political masters will have an expectation that I'm going to start to deliver outcomes in three to five years. So there's going to need to be some poster child apps and success stories and things from a small business that we helped that went global. So in order just to kind of secure our funding and go forward, exportable innovations and, and, and things that we've licensed and spun out of um, the, the, the facility will be the first thing. The second thing is that we're going to try and judge whether the cities that have engaged with us are investing more as a result in integrated city services, because that's part of our opening and enabling the market thing. So have they, through coming in, looking at the future, playing in the lab, or removing the barriers, as a result, invested more money that's opened up and, 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 and grown the market? And the third thing is, have we helped to grow UK companies and their market share in this area, particularly for small businesses? Because a lot of the studies show that big businesses don't actually create new jobs. They just move them about, either within themselves or between themselves. The net job growth is, is from SMEs and from SMEs in the first two or three years of their life. So a big focus on supporting those guys who, if, if you're a London-based or Newcastle or Sunderland-based um, SME, very difficult for you to sell to Beijing or Buenos Aires um, at the moment. But the hope is that through the Catapult Centre, acting as a kind of... Um, showcase um, for what London and the UK can do and, and convening um, cities from around the world, that people get access to those cities, to those clients and to those deals. Finally then, what does this mean for you um, as, as an academic, mostly academic community I think here? Um, the first thing is that we, we will want to to an extent um, function as a, as a kind of knowledge hub and knowledge portal. That's not to say we think we're going to know everything that's going on about cities, but the part, part of our job will be to know who in the academic community, who in the business community is doing what, where the innovations are coming from, where the new ideas are coming from, and to be able to make those connections. And we hope that that kind of connecting up and sharing knowledge will be useful for you. The second thing is potentially support on commercialization. So if you guys have ideas, um, um, IP, R&D um, coming through that is commercializable to help you find the partners, find the markets and, 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 and pull that through. The third thing is potentially joint funding. If we're looking to big, particularly big international funders, we're talking to a lot of the international financial institutions and of course many of us look to Europe that there may be opportunities for, for collaborative approaches and also for helping position each other around funding and um, I think that that, that that could be helpful. And finally we're going to have all sorts of fellowship and knowledge exchange schemes so that we want the best kind of brains and best ideas to be moving out from academia into the catapult working with us and then going back into academia or indeed into, into industry so there's that through flow um, of knowledge going on. So that in, yeah, in about 15 minutes is the um, the, the Future Cities Catapult at the moment. And like all good innovators, we're learning um, as we're going along and trying to um, make our mistakes quickly. Um, and I'm really up for any ideas, solutions, questions you've got either now at the drinks or afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take you up on the, on the invitation for questions. Um, maybe just for 10 minutes before, before we pass sure. the, the drink. Who would like to kick off? city services 
services that don't exist already sometimes. We do have a market. Mm -hmm. And am I, think, you know, am I right in thinking that the services might be saleable to, you know, the 100 smart cities that China's just defined or something like that? I mean, yeah, that's um, would it be like Arab getting together with Cisco and Siemens and so on and producing something like that? And obviously an academic mix potentially too. Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think there'll be a mixture of outputs and outcomes and some of them may be around kind of smarter, smarter city governance. I sort of suspect that it's very, very hard to come up with, with innovations and solutions and apps that, that integrate and solve in city problems in their entirety. Of course, you know, we're, we're not going to do that. So part of what we're going to do probably in the early days is joining up at least two or three city systems and looking at the benefits from integrating, integrating those or taking a more holistic approach. Some of it will be looking at the benefits of just asking some of the, um, the questions perhaps through our, our, our simulator and lab in advance of making city investments. There was that one um, two weeks ago, Eric Pickles, in, I'm not saying anything bad about politicians, but in his wisdom saying we should all be allowed to rent out our parking space in our cities. Now, this is the department that pays for flood defense and the costs of, 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 of flood risk. So we know that if he gives that economic incentive, and we know if it's just 10 or 20% of people take it up and concrete over their front gardens, we can model the increase in, um, in, 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 in flood risk and, and the costs, the externalities imposed on other households and taxpayers from the action. And that will tell you that probably it wasn't a very sensible idea. So to be able to, to look at some of the integrated and bigger um, uh, questions around some of these decisions will be part of it. But, but let, me, let, me, let me give you a concrete example of a project that, one, an early project that we're going to do. So um, I can't name all the partners in it, but Guide Dogs to the Blind came to us and said, how do we make the experience of a blind or partially sighted person in the city as good as possible, as, as near as possible to, to a sighted person? And we're going to be running a, a two-year innovation program with a big tech company with a city, Guide Dogs to the Blind, and a couple of other partners. And looking at how we use data, how we use integration of different city services and so on to, to, to improve that experience. Because if you start with an individual and their, and their experience as a blind person navigating a city, it asks you all sorts of questions about integration and joining up of services and, and information. And the hope out of that project is that we will come up with individual innovations and applications that could be sold around the world because there are lots of blind and partially sighted um, people around the world. But also, for the city in question and for other cities, it's going to tell them all sorts of things about integration and joining up that they should be doing anyway for, for fully sighted or for, for disabled or for, for aging or uh, uh, obese populations so that we will look for those kind of multiple and scalable outcomes. But I think we're going to have to be able to start with a good and exciting innovation question. And I think part of the problem with the integration one is that sometimes it feels so big and challenging that we need to find the right lenses to go into that get the innovation and the partners around that then get the multiple um, benefits spreading out. Sorry, rather long question. Rather, rather long answer. Um, I want to ask you about, about oh no, the future. Mm -hmm. um, you said something very admirable that... Uh, there's not a lot of mileage in getting a lot better at things from the past that we already know may not be very useful. Um, but a lot of your focus seems to be on things that you can do immediately. Most of us have a suspicion the future is going to be really different to, to what is now. And yeah. how will you model or envisage the future? How extreme will you be? What are your time scales? And more significantly, what are your biomes? Yeah. Um, I, d I don't know yet the answer to, to all of those questions. Um, certainly my, my experience in the past was that you go too far into the future and it's not valuable, and, and you're too close and you're actually effectively dealing with the present. So choosing the sort of 20, 30, 20, 40 um, time horizon. Um, the future rushes at you much more quickly than you expect, so it's better to be radical and to... Um, and, and, and to push it. But I, I think my biggest lesson from doing futures at Forum for the Future was that most futures work is never used. People do amazing futures work and everyone nods and it sits on a shelf. The most important thing about doing futures work is designing it in such a way that it changes hearts and minds and behavior. So I think that, that the futures capability that we're going to invest in most heavily in, in my center is, is what we call design futures. 
And that's the ways in which we look into the future and think about if that future were to come to pass, what sort of products, services, lifestyles and so on would you expect to be there? And then we will prototype and design them and make the films in such a way that the future comes to life for the people that are engaging in it and we hope that we can then th therefore ch change their minds more quickly. So. We, I don't know exactly what we're doing, going to do in the program, and I'm hiring, um, in the process of just starting to hire um, a, a top futurist to come and run that program, and they, they've got to have the freedom, I think, to, to do that. But that's, that's my, my thinking at the moment. Good. Yes, thanks. Um, when you introduce your, your lab, which sounds, sounds really fascinating, and I'm excited to, to see what, what that will look like, um, but I noticed you mentioned the word plug-in uh, quite a lot. People could come in plug in their data for visualizations or plug in their data for mashups. So even SMEs who could plug in their um, city solution and test it out. Uh, and to me, the word plug in um, suggests there would be some sort of an interface um, yeah. to, make that, to make that possible. Is that something you have considered? Do you think such an interface exists or could be developed to um, yeah. make that um, an easy thing to do? Sure. I think that's probably lazy use of language by me, so I, I apologize. Um, we, we, we're thinking quite a lot about data and working quite hard on, on how we're going to, because th the lab is only going to be as good as the data sets that we get, so the raw data sets and, and to, 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 to play with. So at the front end, we're investing in a bunch of um, uh, projects with Open Data Institute and, and others on data protocols for cities and starting to think about um, what the data sources are. We'll, ha we'll invest in some projects that themselves generate clouds of new data that we can then say to innovators, go, go play with. Um, C40 cities have just announced that they're going to produce a big um, a, a set of climate and energy data that, that they're happy to share. So. Um, we, we'll, be get, we'll be getting those data. How we then draw that in and in what form, we don't know yet. Again, it's one of the areas that we'll be, um, that we'll be, experimenting, um, we'll be experimenting with. Um, and our sense is, I guess that s some people around, around the catapult would like us after a few years, and you know, if this is possible, to have a sort of model of models, a sim city that you can come in and you build up your library of data, your comparative stories from different cities around the world, and you can test, um, test things against what, you know, the outcomes in, in your own city, depending on how much data we get in, or what's worked in, in, in other cities. We can take some of that into the future, but it's going to take us time to build up the, the, the capacity um, to do that, and I don't, think that, I don't think we're there yet. And what I don't want to do is so many examples of public sector kind of IT um, procurement, you start with a big, um, a big ambition and what could possibly go what could possibly go wrong. <laughs> um, and so I, we, we, re we really want to kind of build up experiment, share with the best of academic practice and, and draw on what you guys are doing um, to, to make that happen. May I allow myself one question? Um, in the, and it's this, that the, the, the bulk of the discussion that, that and the picture you've painted of the, of the catapult um, focuses on data and innovations in the data we have and the data we use mm -hmm. and how we use it. That's fine, and there's going to be, and all, there already are, uh, a whole stack of innovations yeah. that are relevant. But there are many other dimensions along which technology and mm -hmm. science are progressing and innovations that are being created as a result of that. You know, take materials. Yeah. as one example. Mm -hmm. Where do those type of innovations fit into your picture? Yeah. Is that part of the future visioning activity or is that something that somebody else has patched? Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I would say that one of the reasons that we've got this center and that people have bought into it is people's sense of the transformative power of big data and what it might allow us to do. But we, we think, and I, I think it's implicit in your question, that there's been an over-focus on that. And um, wh one of the early features projects we're going to do is, I think people have heard of the kind of the bang technologies, bits, atoms, neurons, genes, that are going to transform um, um, how, how we live. And, and to, to, to look at the other transformative technologies and what they're going to mean for cities and ask that in some kind of quite profound and, and future-facing ways and, and, and then bring that back in, into the present. So we do want to do that. I think, I suppose, we're sort of riding a bit of a bow wave of interest from, from, from business and from, 
our paymasters in government around how data in particular can unlock, um, unlock change in cities. But it's a, it's a very valid challenge. Time for one more. The gentleman in the front. He's hopefully next to the mic. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, so do you have any plans for uh, public engagement activities, whether it's in this sort of decision theater or in some other way, to get a sense of you know, what people think the future of London ought to look like? Um, we do. And um, one, of, one of the things that we've, we've struggled with, one of the critiques of a lot of the smart city agenda was that where's the citizen in it and is it that kind of you know a big IT company in a city and an algorithm will come together and make the world a, a, a better place for everybody and um, so we, we have thought quite hard about citizen engagement and put people on our board who um, are taking us to task on that but um, clearly I haven't articulated that very well in, um, in, in, in what I've said so it is going to be an important part of um, what we do and we're going to spend money and time and asking those in questions, qu asking those questions, and engaging um, citizens um, in in defining what we're on the, the, the issues on which we're innovating and, and, and what we're doing. Um, but again, precisely what we're going to do is, is still up for grabs, and we're open. You know, we're open to, to ideas. We did have a, a, a discussion with the Foresight team, who are obviously doing the big future of cities um, piece of work. The UK government Foresight team in possibly doing some joint public engagement work on what people want and expect from the future of cities in the UK that may come to pass and then we can feed that into both of our both of our programs. Okay, thank you Peter. I'm sure we could go on much longer with many more questions, but I'm also very much aware that for everybody, particularly for Peter, it's been a very long day. So I think we, we really must draw conclusions, uh, draw proceedings to a conclusion now today. Uh, I'm assured that there are drinks upstairs for those of us that need to wet our whistle. Um, would you please join me both in thanking Peter for his presentation to close today and also for, as it were, celebrating ourselves for having stuck at it uh, over what was quite a long and demanding day. So thank you all very much.